Good to see you. We are in a series uh, called The Blessed Life, and I do want to say welcome to all the churches that are joining us, and I want you to turn to Luke chapter 16. And that's the only passage I'm going to ask you to turn or click to, um, but just however you do it, just go to Luke chapter 16, and uh, we're going to talk this weekend about breaking the spirit of mammon. Breaking the spirit of mammon, M-A-M-M-O-N. Uh, it's a word that's in the Bible only four times. Uh, Jesus, as we know, only used it three times. One of the times it's in the Bible, it's a repeat. It's in Matthew and Luke, but it's the same sermon. So we're going to look at it in Luke so that we'll see all the times that we know of that Jesus used this word, all right? Luke chapter 16, look at verse 9. Luke 16, verse 9. This is Jesus speaking. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. That's the first time we see the word. That when you fail, they, I just want you to remember the word they, not it, they, so it's talking about the friends, may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, it's the second time we've seen it, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? And then verse 13 is a repeat of the verse in Matthew 6, no servant. No, I, no servant, not one, no person, no person. This is very important to understand this. Uh, Matthew said this way, no one, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And that's the third time we see it. And again, that's a repeat from a verse in Matthew 6. It's from the same sermon. You cannot serve God and mammon. Okay, this is the only phrase like this in the Bible that where Jesus contrasts serving God with something as, as, as uh, uh, clearly as he does. You cannot serve. You cannot do it. No one can do this. You cannot serve God and mammon. Okay, since he said that, we need to know what mammon is. So I have three points for you today. Here's point number one. They're actually all three questions. What is mammon? What is mammon? Most people would immediately say money, but, but the answer is so much deeper than that. Uh, mammon is an Aramaic word, which means riches, uh, but it comes from the Syrian god of riches. I don't believe Jesus was simply referring to riches. I think he was referring to a false god that they knew. The Syrians had a god called Mammon, and it was the god of riches. Now, let me tell you where it came from. It actually came from Babylon. A lot of people don't know where Babylon came from. If you just look at the very first part of it, Babel. Babylon came from the Tower of Babel. That's where Babylon came from. And if you ever want to know what the word Babylon means, just say it a little differently, a little slower, Babylon. You ever known anybody just babble? Okay, never mind. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't nudge anyone or look at someone right now, you know. But Babel means, actually means confusion. You know, someone just talking, you, don't ever, you, don't, you can't follow them, you don't know what they're talking about. Babel, the word Babel means confusion. When you add the suffix on, on it, it means sown, uh, are planted. So the word Babylon means sown in confusion. It started in confusion. The Tower of Babylon, the Tower of Babel, was the, a system that they believed that they didn't need God. They could get to heaven on their own, their own energy, their own work could get them high enough to get to heaven. That is what the spirit of mammon is, that we don't need God if we have riches and money. It is a spirit that contrasts itself 
with the Spirit of God. It is a, an arrogant, prideful spirit that tries to replace God. When you think about this, it's, see, Jesus said you, you can't serve God and mammon. In other words, mammon is looking for servants. Mammon wants to rule in your life. Mammon wants you to look to it instead of God. And here's the problem. Many of us actually grew up looking to mammon, and we didn't even know it. And, and Jesus makes this statement. You can't serve both, and he, he says, you will be loyal to one and despise the other. Now, I want you to think about this. There's a message today that that's we, we call the prosperity message. It's basically give and you'll get, give and you'll get, and, and you know, God wants to, to bless everyone with lots of money and a Mercedes and a Rolex. And uh, the problem with that message is that it actually works selfishness and greed into your life instead of out of your life. And the problem with that is it's a mammon message. And here's the problem. You become loyal to that. Now, here's what happens. When people buy into the prosperity message, what happens then is that when something breaks or something goes wrong in their life financially, they despise God. They get mad at God. And here's the reason they get mad at God or despise God, because they're loyal to mammon. Jesus said if you're loyal to mammon, you'll despise God. Mammon wants to take God's place. Mammon actually promises us everything that only God can give us. You think about it. Mammon promises us identity, security, significance, uh, happiness, joy, all these things only God can give. Listen, only God can give peace, love, and joy. Only God. Mammon can't. Mammon can never deliver on its promise. Mammon wants to rule. You can't serve God and mammon. I'll tell you something that might shock you about mammon. Mammon is the spirit of Antichrist. And I'll prove it to you by a very simple verse that all of you know, but it's shocking how many people never put this together. The spirit of Antichrist does not rule through the threat of nuclear war. The spirit of Antichrist rules through the threat of not being able to buy and sell. That's mammon. If you don't bow to me, if you don't take the mark of the beast, you won't be able to provide for your family. See, it's a contrast. All through, all, all, all through our lives, mammon is trying to get you to bow to mammon, serve mammon, worship mammon, and Jesus is saying, no, God is the only one that can provide everything you need. God is the only one that can provide identity and security and peace and happiness and joy and love. Only God can. But mammon says he can. Mammon will say, you know, if you had more money, people will listen to you. Significance. If you had more money, if you had the right credit cards, if you had the right clothes, if you had the right car, if you had the right house, if you had more money, you'd be happier. If you had more money, um, you, 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 you'd have a better marriage. If you had more money, here, here's the big lie, if you had more money, you could help more people. Listen to me very carefully. Money doesn't help people, God helps people. But notice the contrast. See the contrast? Money, okay, look, look, here, Jesus never told anyone that he needed more money. Never did a leper, never did a lame man, never did a blind man say, have mercy on me, son of David, and Jesus turned around and say, oh, you just need more money. <laughs> Not once. And I'll tell you again how it contrasts, just, just to show you how we've all been influenced by the spirit of mammon. We've all had this thinking at some point or another. I either need God to come through or I need someone to give me some money. And if someone would give me some money, I'm okay, God. My problem's been solved. I don't, I don't need you because I got money. Are, are, are you following me? Yeah. I can remember one time my, um, I borrowed my dad's boat uh, when we were, when our family was younger. We have a boat now, but when our family was younger, 
uh, my dad had a boat, never used it. I think he kept it just for us, you know, for the kids to use. And I'm grateful for that. But he got a brand new boat. I borrowed it. We're on vacation. Something started beeping. Uh, the beeping bothered me, so I got up under the dash and pulled the wire out. <clears throat> this is something you do when you're young and stupid. <laughs> it was trying to tell me something. It was trying to tell me that it was low on oil. But I kept driving, and we burned the motor up. Brand new motor. $4,000. I said to my dad, Dad, um, I, I'm, 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 this is my responsibility, and I'm going to take care of this. I, I will figure out a way to take care of this. And I said, this is my problem. I'll take care of it. And you know what my dad said to me? Son, you've never had a problem. I will never forget this conversation as long as I live. I said, what do you mean? He said, son, if money can fix it, it's not a problem. And if money can't fix it, God can. He was telling me right then, it's, money's not the answer to your problems. Son, God is always the answer to your problems. So that's mammon. Mammon is this spirit that tries to influence us. Here's question number two. Is money evil? Is money evil? Because Jesus said unrighteous mammon. Well, what he's talking about is a spirit. It's a spirit. I, let me just say again, mammon is a spirit. <laughs> uh, if, if mammon's not a spirit, how come it can talk? Because you, 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 try, you start to give an offering, and I'll bet you'll hear voices. <laughs> Mammon is a spirit that rests on money. I don't know if you ever thought about it. Can I tell you this? All money has a spirit on it. It either has the spirit of God on it or it has the spirit of mammon on it. All the money in your account right now either has God's spirit on it or the spirit of mammon. And the way you get God's spirit on it, according to Scripture, is you give the first 10% to the house of God, and God redeems the rest out from under the spirit of this world, which is the spirit of mammon. Why would you want the spirit of mammon on, on your money? So money money's not evil. Money's neutral. You can do good with money. You can do bad with money. People say, well, but the Bible says that money's the root of all evil. It's not what it says. Here's what it says, 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, in other words, they got under the spirit of mammon, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Here, here's what I think he's saying. Loving and serving mammon is the root of all evil. Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon. Loving and serving mammon is the root of all evil. Now, look, look at this verse be, uh, because it, it's, it's strange the way it reads, and a lot of us don't understand it. Verse 9 says, and I say to you, this is Jesus talking, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Okay, I have to admit to you, when I first read that as a new believer, I totally misunderstood it. It's, you know, I'm thinking of unrighteous mammon as just money, not, not a God or a spirit of greed. And, and I, so it said, make friends with money. That's what I thought it meant. So I thought it meant, you know, do uh, favors for other people, and then when you're in trouble, they'll, they'll do something for you. You know, that's what I thought. That's not at all what he's saying. He's saying, take this unrighteous mammon and redeem it by giving the first to the house of God and use this Use the money that Satan uses for evil. You use it for good, and you use it to build the kingdom of God, and people will get saved. They will become your friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. And it says when you fail, this word fail means die. It means when you die, when you expire physically. Listen, and when you die, they, these people who've come to Christ because you gave to the kingdom, listen, will welcome you into your eternal home. <laughs> That's what he's saying. In other words, there are going to be people in heaven that welcome me that say, I'm here because you gave. 
I know that a missionary came and brought the gospel to us, but I found out, because when heaven said, we're going to know things, I found out there were 47 people that supported that missionary, and you're one of the 47, and if you hadn't supported that missionary, I wouldn't be in the kingdom today. That, that's what he's talking about. See, God is the only one who can take unrighteous mammon and turn it into souls. True riches. That's what true riches are. Um, when I first got saved, um, if you remember, Debbie and I were married before I got saved. And um, when I got saved, I wanted to witness, but I just, just, just couldn't quite do it. And, and was shy, if you can believe that. <laughs> And um, so uh, I got over it, but I, got, I was shy. And uh, so I remember when I found tracks. Now, I don't know how many of you remember tracks. How many of you remember tracks? Tracks were like little books that shared the gospel story. And I thought, so that came out of drugs. So I thought, this is cool, because tracks used to be when the policeman said, okay, roll your sleeve up. And, And I thought, wow, I don't know who came with the name of Tracks. Must have been an ex-addict, but I, that's great. That's great. Going to share the gospel through Tracks, you know. So, so anyway, so I would get these Tracks and I'd leave them on tables when we would eat. You know, I'd leave the tip inside. But nobody ever said anything. And so I remember thinking to myself, I'm, I'm just not leaving a big enough tip. And so I've talked to Debbie about it. We prayed about it. We saved up. We did not have enough to do this. We left a $50 bill in a track one time. Our meal might have been $10, you know and a $50 tip with the track. We go back to that restaurant a few weeks later, and this uh, lady that waited on us came up. She said, I've been waiting to talk to you. I read that little book, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And she said, and I called my husband and read it to him over the phone, and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And I got so excited, but I remember her, her wording struck me kind of oddly. I said, what do you mean you called your husband? I mean, was he at work or was he at home? And she put her head down, and she said, He's in prison. Can I tell you something? I'm going to meet that guy one day. And he's going to say thank you for the $50 tip. Because I got saved because of that. By the way, a few years later, he got out of prison. And Debbie and I had the honor of, of seeing him and his wife get baptized. <laughs> Simply because of that. See, what I'm trying to tell you I'm trying to tell you is that God can actually take our money and turn it into souls. It is amazing. You can give to the church and God can turn it into souls. It's phenomenal. So money is not evil. And here's the third thing, question, what should I do with my money? What should I do with money? What should I do with money? Uh, well, let me just give you an answer is be a good steward with what you have. Just be a good steward with what you have. Now, here's what some of you might be thinking. Uh, Pastor, I have too little of this unrighteous mammon to be concerned with this message. <laughs> if I had more, then I would probably be taking notes and listening very intently, but this just isn't, isn't really helping me, okay? Now, listen to me lovingly. If that's your way of thinking, that I have too little to be concerned with this that Jesus taught. Listen, if that's your way of thinking, you never will have any more. Uh, verse 10 says, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Please hear me. If you have a little and you don't tithe, you'll never have much. What God does is we all start out with a little, and he sees if he, if he can trust us. And if he can trust us, he gives us more, and he gives us more, and he gives us more until we get to the level where we can be a blessing to our family and be a blessing to others, whatever that amount would be. But if, 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 if you're not faithful with a little, you, you're never going to have much. Uh, verse 12 says, and if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Now, there are a lot of applications for this, but I just want to give you one application, possible application. 
Remember, we've talked for a couple of weeks now about the tithe, and I know God owns it all, but according to Scripture, He's reserved the tithe. He said, it is mine. It belongs to me. I've set it apart. Don't touch it. If you take it, it's stolen. It's consecrated. It's holy. It's set apart to the Lord. Okay. If you've not been faithful in what's another man, who will give you what is your own? Is it possible that one application of this verse could be, if you're not faithful with the 10%, who will give you the 90? If you're not faithful with the tithe, which belongs to the Lord, who's going to give you more? Please hear me. This is so important for us to understand. It's, it's like I said last weekend, God's testing us. A few weekends ago, two weeks ago, God's testing us to see what we're going to do with the first 10%. And then look at verse 11. This is the last scripture we're going to look at. It says, therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Okay. Well, what, what are true riches? Well, I can tell you, it's real simple. True riches are people. Uh, if you looked around this room, in whatever room you're sitting in, whatever campus or church you're attending, listen to me. You look around this room, you're seeing the only thing that's going to last for eternity. Not the bodies, the souls. Souls, they're the only things going to last. When I was in college, we had this guy, he's kind of radical, you know, and, uh, uh, and he just had this little saying, it's going to burn We would drive by like a really nice house, and you know, we were in college, we'd say, look at that house. He'd say, it's going to burn. <laughs> well, he was right. I mean, it's all going to burn. Heaven and earth is going to be destroyed. I understand that. <laughs> but it really is true. It's all going to burn, except for souls. Souls last forever. Yeah. Well, let me say it another way. Heaven is being populated, and hell is being plundered by our offerings. That's why it's so important for me to give, and why I see it as a spiritual act, because when I give, people are getting saved. God is taking what was unrighteous, mammon. I've redeemed it by giving the first to him, and then as I give offerings, he's turning it into true riches. True riches are people. Um, when Ethan, my son-in-law, and Elaine, my daughter, started dating, uh, Ethan came to me and talked to me first, and I set up guidelines, you know, for him. And, uh, and because I wanted to see if he'd honor me. Here, here's the reason. If he wouldn't honor me, he wouldn't honor her. That's for some of the young men here. And so I, we t I brought him in, we talked. I also showed him my gun collection, by the way. Uh, but, um, but I gave him some rules to follow and some things, you know. And then after a few months, and he did it. He did everything right. He did everything right. He did everything I told him to do. So after a few months, I gave him the, the, uh, the okay to start dating. And so one night there at seven, our young adult group, and they're standing around talking with a group of young adults afterwards, and they were talking about what it would be like to date the pastor's daughter, you know? <laughs> and it's Ethan and Lane and seven or eight other young adults, you know? And uh, it was funny because uh, one of them said to Elaine, you know, your dad is so strict on tithing. I'll bet he checks the tithing records of the guys that want to date you. <laughs> and Elaine, Elaine said, he does. And when she said that, Ethan went, uh-oh. <laughs> and Elaine said, what are you saying? You, you told me you tithed. You told me you tithed. What are you, what are you, what are you saying uh-oh for? And Ethan said, well, there was one time I was one day late. <laughs> and he explained to her, you know, uh, she said, what do you mean? He said, well, I, I would always do my tithe. I'd get paid on Friday. So at work, I would go online and do my tithe because I didn't have internet at home. Uh, because it costs so much, and he's a real good steward. And so, said, I didn't have internet at home, so I would always do it at work on Friday when I got paid. But one Friday, I didn't go to work. I didn't have to work that Friday. I had to work Saturday, so I did it on Saturday. But I've always regretted that my tithe wasn't, you know, every Friday, that it was one day late. And they got to laughing, and they said, oh, 
to Elaine. They said, your dad's not going to notice that. And Elaine said, yes, he will. <laughs> so they said, why don't you ask him? Why don't you ask him? So she came home that night. And she said, hey, Dad, uh, did you check uh, Ethan's tithing record? I said, yeah, I sure did. <laughs> she said, well, was everything okay? I said, there was one time he was one day late. <laughs> and the next time we meet, I'm going to ask him about it. By the way, too. Okay, but why, why wouldn't I check the tithing record of a young man that wants to date my daughter? Let me say it another way. Why would I give my daughter to a thief? If he can't even handle money, I mean, he definitely can't handle Elaine because Elaine is a handful. <laughs> He's not going to be able to handle her if he can't handle dollars and cents. <laughs> but let me say it another way. She's my only daughter. She's priceless. Why would I give true riches to someone that can't handle unrighteous mammon? Can't even handle money. Well, let me say it another way. Why would the heavenly Father, who has all power to bless you, why would he bless you when you don't steward what you already have? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes.